Who is Jesus for us or for you? Who is Jesus? This is a question that still follows us. Everybody wants to have a Jesus that suits them. And at the end of the sermon, I will read to you 10 Jesus or Jesuses that we, that we have in this day. But Jesus is not one that is going to be defined by our own standards. We love to define Jesus according to my needs. If you need a, if you need a Jesus who gives you money, you can get a Jesus who gives you money. If you, if you don't have a boyfriend or you don't have a girlfriend, Jesus can be your boyfriend. Jesus can be your girlfriend. And all this type of Jesus that Jesus just refuses to align himself with. Jesus defines himself. He's not defined by other people. If you see Peter, he says, you are the Messiah. But then he goes off and rebukes Jesus because his definition of Messiah doesn't align with Jesus' definition. And as we hear every week, this is, this is, a, this is becoming an every week thing, an, almost an every day, uh, when people want to make Jesus such an inclusivist. He wants to draw all people, because he does. He, wants to, he came to die for the whole world. But he wants to restore your life to God's ultimate aim. Not to your own, not to my own. Let us go to the text. Jesus and his disciples went on to villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? I don't dare to ask that because I may get a lot of that flack. <laughs> Imagine asking my friends, and I asked, that, I asked before, who do people say I am? And say, well, you, are, you talk too much? <laughs> well, some people say they think you, you, you are like a know-it-all guy. Some people say yeah, they think I'm funny. <laughs> but Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And this is a very interesting question done in a very interesting, interesting place. Because Mark says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi is an area founded on the honor of the emperor, Caesar. And in Mark, we don't see that, but in Matthew, we see you are the Christ, the Son of God. And in Roman times, there was only one Son of God, Caesar. Got that? <laughs> There's only one son of God, Caesar. So Matthew, who's a Jewish guy writing for a Jewish audience, he tells his readers, Jesus is in Caesarea Philippi, a city built on honor of, the, of Caesar, the son of God, but he is not the son of God. Jesus is the son of God. So you see a bit of political uh, issues here. It's not the Carmen who's the one that has the ultimate aim, the one who has the ultimate authority. And just to give you just a background of Romans 13, Romans 13, a lot of people love to call that when the government does what they want. <laughs> when the government passes laws according to their thinking, According to their liking, they say, oh, Romans 13, uh, uh, governments are placed by God. But when government takes the wrong decisions, they don't like that verse. Because we have been misunderstood that verse. Rome thought of itself that itself put onto the throne 
and they had ultimate authority and nobody could put them out. But Paul comes and he says in Romans 13, all authority is placed by whom? By God. So just as God puts them there, God can take them away. That's what the text is saying. And of course, we have to obey our garments. But the ultimate aim of that text is not that we should blindly obey any laws that come from Canberra, in our case, or from Spring Street, if you are in Victoria. We are Victoria. But the ultimate aim is that God is in control. So, you find this answer by Peter. And, people, and the disciples reply, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And it's, and it's interesting that in, um, in Luke, I believe, it says Jeremiah. It doesn't say Elijah, it says Jeremiah. So if you read um, Ma uh, Matthew 16, 13 to 20, and then Luke 9, 18 to 21, you see the parallels and the discrepancies that, that, that the evangelists talk about. This answer. Some, some people say in Mark that you are the John, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others say one of the prophets. It's very interesting to see that they are referring to people who have done great things among the people of Israel. That they believe that they come back to life. John the Baptist was beheaded. Elijah he was taken to heaven. Or some of the prophets that may come back from the dead. But Jesus asked them. But before that, there's a lot of false prophets today that they love to be called John the Baptist or they love to be called Elijah. There's a guy in Africa who, who is called as the, the final Elijah. That he's the one that's bringing, a, a, I think you, you hear about this, ben or something like that, and, and, and he's called by his disciples Elijah because he does great things and he actually predicted a, the last earthquake in Chile. He predicted it. But then he predicted something else and it, it, it didn't come to pass. And he has predicted many things in Africa and they don't come to pass. So these false prophets, what they do is that they say whatever, 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 and if they get one, oh, I'm a true prophet. But people tend to forget that they lost many other ones. Like today, today is Rosh Hashanah. Today is a Jewish holiday, actually. Today is the year of Jubilee. It's starting today. So this guy in the USA, he said that the, today, uh, the 13th of October will be a, blue, a, a gloom and doom day. It's a Jewish rabbi, or I don't know if he's a rabbi because I've never seen where he studied, but He's a, a, a Jewish Messiah, uh, Messianic Jew. And he said that by September 11, you could expect Wall Street to go down and crash. And that was going to start the judgment of God on America. Well, actually, the stock market went 100 points up. And then he started saying, well, but you know, God can move the times and maybe the time has been set aside for a later time. So you find all these people who are, want to be prophets and they love being called prophets, but they're not. But Jesus goes to his disciples and he says, but what about you, he asks, who do you say I am? And Peter, who's, who's actually after Jesus, Peter is the main character in the book of Mark because what we know is that Mark um, was written by, by a disciple of Peter. Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And this is the so-called messianic secret. Jesus doesn't want anybody to know who he is. And do you see the difference between Jesus and today's so-called uh, preachers that they want everybody to know them. They have a whole um, industry for them to be known. They got uh, public relations people who are always trying to make their names be out there. 
Well, Jesus, he wants to stay quiet. He just wants to do God's work. He doesn't want to be bothered. In the, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells Peter, and let's, go, let, let's go and read it. I, I, I want you to, to see what I'm talking about. Matthew 16, verse 13 and following. Sixteen says, "When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and again, see, uh, Matthew picks up the same where what Mark picks up. He asked his disciples, "Who do people say the Son of Man is? The Son of Man, another uh, enigmatic title that Jesus used about himself, the Son of Man. And Son of Man doesn't mean that he's human. If you ever thought that, well, Jesus doesn't use it like that." Son of man means a heavenly being. In Daniel, when you see one like a son of man coming from the heavens. Son of man doesn't mean that Jesus is human. Son of man within Matthew, within the Bible, means that he's a heavenly being. Except for Jeremiah, because Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they're called son of man time and time again. But in Jesus' usage, he applies it to himself as somebody who comes from heaven. The reply, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are Christ, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by men, but by my Father in heaven. And then he comes on. But later on in the same chapter, he rebukes Peter. When he starts talking in verse 21, he says, From the time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that, that, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. <coughs> Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. He said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, <coughs> but the things of men. So how come somebody who, who had this revelation from God, how could he come so stray, rebuking the Lord? If you read the, the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has done many great things. Many great things. He had um, calmed the storms. He had healed many people. He had raised the dead. He had given food to thousands. He had come the, 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 the sea of Galilee when it was raining. He had given sights to the blind. He had, he had given hearing to the deaf. How can a man like that be killed? He looks invincible. Doesn't he? If you can raise somebody, somebody from the dead, what sort of power does this guy have? Who is this? And you find this question asked again and again in the Bible. If you go to, uh, to, ch uh, to chapter 4, verse 41 of Mark, you find this question come up by the disciples. When he comes the storm, they say, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And then again in 649, you find the same question uh, by the disciples. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and, terif and, and were terrified. So who's this ghost walking on the, on, on, the, on the water? And then the question keeps on going in, 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 um, in Mark 15, 2, um, when Pontius Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? So the question keeps on coming up, up, up in Mark. Who is this guy? 
But we have the answer in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, if you want to follow me. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, he says, The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And remember, Mark is written to Romans. And I said before, who do, who do the Romans think is the Son of God? Caesar. But who does Mark say is the Son of God? Jesus. And then, at the end of the Gospel, you find the answer again. Mark 15, 39 says this. And when the centurion, who, the, who did the centurion work for? For the Romans. And listen to what he says. And then the centurion who stood then in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died. He said, surely this man was the son of God. So you start the gospel with claiming who Jesus is. And at the end you find a centurion, somebody who works for Rome, who has pledged allegiance to the only son of God, who is Caesar, affirming that Jesus is the son of God. That Jesus has the ultimate power, even though he sees him dead on the cross. Even though at the cross it seems like Caesar has won. Because you only put to death people who go against Caesar. What a powerful message for today that people who are in power don't have ultimate power. That even though we die in the book of Revelations, even though those who die for Christ are really the winners because they are, the, they are going to have eternal life with God. Because our enemies will also have eternal life apart from God. He then began to teach them what the Son of Man was to suffer many things and be rejected. And I'm back to, to Mark. Mark 8, 31. The elder chief priests and teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called a crowd to him along with the disciples and said, If anyone come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. And the cross was a sign of shame at the times of the Romans. Not like us. We, you see, even non-Christians wearing crosses now because it's fashionable. But if you read um, um, first century or second century accounts of crucifixions, talk about the cross is something to be ashamed of. Because what happened at the cross was shameful. What happened at the cross, people were that, um, and I like how Michelangelo, when he did the Sistine Chapel, he did something naughty. He, he drew up everybody naked. And he drew Jesus naked at the cross because Jesus was naked at the cross. You try to shame that person at the cross the most you can. You try to shame them. And some people will take three days to die. So during those three days to die, you will, do, you will find a lot of unpleasant things under the cross. Only the mothers, only the wives, only the children will, will stay close to the cross. The cross didn't make a nice sight. The cross didn't make a nice smell. And you were not allowed to take the person from the cross. So you, you're going to see your friend, your mother, well, because they used to crucify women, they will crucify children, just to make a point that Rome has the ultimate power. But think of men. Men being crucified there. And you see the cross eating their eyes, as you, as you remember the, the passion of the Christ. Even though it's not in the Bible, but we know that that happened in the cross as well. 
The animals come and eat you. That's how bad the cross is. So Jesus says to, to his disciples and to his followers, come and carry your cross. And if you carry a cross, it means that you will soon die. Because nobody in the Roman world would carry a cross unless they are going to be crucified. If anyone come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world for, for, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me, there, there you go, ashamed. Ashamed. If anyone is ashamed of carrying a cross, because you know what's going to happen to you if you carry a cross, you're being condemned as a criminal. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory and the holy angels. And he said to them, I'll tell you the truth. Some of you are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. And where do you see the kingdom of God come with power? At the cross. Because there and then, Jesus won the war against sin, against the powers and principalities of this earth. And, and God confirmed that in his resurrection. So this is Jesus' definition of what he's come to do. Jesus didn't come to make us rich. Jesus didn't come to give us our best house. No, he didn't. Jesus came to die for us and to call us to die for him, which is not a nice thing. I'd like to read to you quickly now some modern takes of Jesus. I'm doing this, this course on the historical Jesus. I could, tell you, I could tell you a lot about Jesus, how people have seen him, how um, in the 17th century, Herman, Herman Raimarus started writing this thing about Jesus, that he didn't believe that, um, that Jesus did any miracles. Um, this is a German thing. Um, <coughs> and, um, but he was smart. He wrote the book, and he kept it. He died, and then he published it. <laughs> Because there was another guy, Strauss, who published his book. He was 27 years old. It's a very good book to read. Very old, very ancient now, 1827, I think. It was um, 1826, published. Yet, he could never have a job again as a university professor because he believed that a lot of the things that Jesus taught were myths, so nobody liked him after that. But let me read you something modern. Mo Ten modern takes that Jesus is taken and with this I'll finish you have the guru guru Jesus this is the Jesus of the enlightenment the, G the Jesus who existed in human history but it is not nearly as radical as the Jesus of the gospels guru Jesus is the wise winsome slightly supernatural figure who fits nicely alongside other religion titans like Buddha Muhammad Vishnu and others this is a safe Jesus who will only ever tell you as good, affirming, uplifting things, but doesn't bother us with dangerous talk of the kingdom of God. There's the problem with the Guru Jesus. Not only does he defy the historical record in the, ter in the, in the terms of Jesus himself, he also much less compelling, he's also much less compelling than the Christ of Scripture. Guru Jesus doesn't meet the deepest longings of human experience, doesn't answer the problem of evil, and offers no hope for future cosmic renewal. The second one is red letter Jesus. And if you have a Bible like mine, I have a lot of red letters here, so. <laughs> red letter Jesus. This Jesus is a bog, is in vogue among many well meaning progressive evangelicals. He said, Jesus, I'm tempted at times to embrace. He's present in the kind of Christianity that only takes seriously those quotes of Jesus in the gospel that mark out 
by Bible publishers in red ink. What is convenient about this Jesus is that he replaces the so-called angry God of the Old Testament with the mostly peaceful, healing, non-controversial Jesus of justice. What's more, he's way more likable than the Apostle Paul, who just doesn't understand 21st century social norms. There is only one problem with red letter Jesus. He, in his very red letter statements, declared solidarity with the Old Testament scriptures. He spoke of an unbreakable Bible and coming not to abolish an iota or jot of the law. If we accept Jesus as a full member of the Trinity, and if we accept the idea of inspiration of scripture, we have to say that all the letters of the Bible are read. Not only the ones that we like, not only the ones that we underline. Not just the statements that Jesus we like to put on coffee mugs. We love to put certain things around the house and things about Jesus. But what about not making the house of the Lord a house of them, a house of robbers? We don't put that on the houses. It doesn't look good. Plus, have you read some some of those red letters? Jesus says some pretty controversial things in there about marriage, about hell, and about his coming kingdom. This one I like. Braveheart Jesus. Remember Braveheart, yeah? You remember the movie? The blood and the macho and everything. So this is Braveheart Jesus. This Jesus has come to help men recover their masculinity. Masculinity. The Jesus of Braveheart, John Wayne Westerns and big name hunting. This Jesus is a response to a very clear crisis in the culture, a crisis of manhood. But a Christ-shaped masculinity isn't, re isn't defined by hyper-masculine masculine tough talk, cuss words, or MMA. The Jesus of Scripture was both tough and tender, a man who rebuked and nurtured. And he didn't come to conform men into a modern hyper-masculine -mas construct, but into men who fulfill their unique kingdom purposes as servants leaders in the home, the church, and the community. The problem of fatherlessness and masculinity won't be solved with more bacon. I go to these men breakfast and they always say, we're going to have bacon. And I don't eat bacon, so <laughs> it doesn't matter to me if you have bacon or not. But having bacon at a men's breakfast doesn't make you more of a man, my brothers. <laughs> But through the gospel, transformation of men who lay down their falling impulses of the first Adam to follow the second. I love this one because I grew up in the United States, so I can talk about this. American Jesus. This Jesus is patriotic. He wants national renewal. He goes on to war all the time. He's a Jesus who ushers in a revival whose results turn the map from blue to red, if you understand. Blue Democrats, red Republicans. So who, whenever you see the American map and you see red in election, that's Republican, Jesus is there. This is a Jesus who, if follow, will return us to a perceived glory days of yesterday. The problem with this Jesus is not just that he's being appropriated as a mascot of the GOP, which is the Grand Old Party, the Republican Party, but looks strangely different from the real Jesus of Scripture. The Christ of the Gospels didn't point his people to the 1950s. Remember? And who is old enough to remember the Billy Graham Crusades? A lot of people want to go to that. I mean, I wish. I mean, I remember my, my old days are the 80s. So. <laughs> but Jesus is, doesn't want us to go back to the 1950s. He wants us to move forward Zion, towards Jerusalem, the heavenly one. Jesus isn't simply interested in returning America to a false era of bygone glory. He lived and died and rose again to renew the entire cosmos, not only a country. Not only a country. 
When I was live, growing up in the USA, you felt like America was the only country that could save the whole world. And when they heard me speaking Spanish, they would, say, they would say, you should speak American. And I would answer back, well, America is a Spanish name. It was given to America by Christopher Columbus, who took it up from a girl in Spain. So if, when you hear America, America is a Spanish name. <laughs> if you didn't know that. <laughs> so the American Jesus always disappoints because he seeks ultimate satisfaction in short-term victories instead of a long-term view of kingdom of God. The Jesus scripture offers a final consummation of heaven on earth and at least his people as future kings and queens of the universe. So, the American Jesus makes you feel proud to be an American. But when you go outside America, people ask, why do they, why do they like us? We thought Jesus likes us. Why, if Jesus likes us, why doesn't the whole world like us? And I must say, because you bomb everybody else. Left wing Jesus. Left wing Jesus. This Jesus who serves as a mascot for progressive social causes. Jesus wouldn't deny anybody being a pastor because Jesus doesn't discriminate. So if you are Latino, if you are Chinese, if you are Aussie, if you are whatever, Jesus is not going to deny you being a pastor. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus is not going to do that. But how about being somebody who rose banks, somebody who is stealing from his boss? Would Jesus deny him being a pastor? No, no, because Jesus is inclusivist. But you just said that Jesus has morals. Doesn't Jesus have morals? Like the right wing who like the right wing who appropriate Christ for political aims, the Jesus of the left hints at truth. It is true that the good news of the kingdom means good news for the poor, and yet Jesus coming wasn't the first advent of Karl Marx but the advent of God's end time salvation, the inauguration of a new covenant between God and his people, mediated through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Some people want to bring the kingdom of God on their own terms, and they don't want to wait Jesus to come back. We have to do our best to lessen pain and suffering in our community, but we also have to see that Jesus will ultimately bring the end of sin. Not us. Not us. And Dr. Phil Jesus. How many here have seen Dr. Phil on TV? That's okay. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> but Dr. Phil Jesus is one that is tough-talking dispenser of advice. He gives you advice all the time. Evangelicals love the Jesus because he's the solution for all the problems. This Jesus comes close to the real Christ of Scripture, who is the answer of our deepest needs. And yet he changes a pursuit of Christ for pursuit of principles. And this is an issue that I hear in many, many churches. The preacher comes and he says, I'm going to teach you these biblical principles for you to be a better dad, for you to be a better pastor in, in some conferences. For you to be a better worker, for you to be a better um, wife. So they're always teaching principles, 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 like if church will be a 12 step recovery program. But we're not a 12 step recovery program. We're not Alcoholic Anonymous. Jesus didn't come to die so you could get a job, Jesus didn't die so you could get into your preferred university. Yes, he can help you, but he didn't come for that. The real Jesus came to die for our sins. Prosperity Jesus. He came to give us prosperity, my brother and sister. He came to make us rich. 
He didn't come to do that. He himself died as a poor man. He himself didn't have a place to put his head. He himself relied on people to feed him. He didn't have a $12 million house as some preachers do today. He didn't have a, six, a 75 million jet to go and preach the gospel. He didn't have the best Mercedes or the best BMWs or the best whatever to show everybody that God is with him. He didn't wear the best suit, although he, his suit was good. <laughs> but he wasn't wearing the best clothes. As you see some preachers that when I see them, I said, wow, that suit costs more than I make in a month. Or when you see these Christian um, celebrities, when they have in front of, in front of uh, the, the, some of the advertisement, and you see these big rings, they take, in Latin America, that's how they do it. They, they, they like singers, they would just pose for the, for the photo, and they have big rings and showing off the rings, how Jesus blesses them. Nah, Jesus didn't come for that. Jesus takes, take, says, take up your cross, not take up your purse. <laughs> Jesus calls us to take up our cross and follow him. And there are only three more and I finish. Post-church Jesus. Some people say, I stay at home. Jesus understands. I don't want to go to church because church is full of hypocrites. Because church is full of fights. Because sometimes the sound is very bad. Because sometimes the musicians get it wrong. So I'd rather put a CD or an MP3 player and listen to good musicians. Or sometimes the preacher doesn't get it right. He, me he messes up with the sermon. Or I just don't like getting along with people. Jesus calls us to believe in community. He comes to save a church made up of individuals, not individuals who make up a church. The real Jesus doesn't offer his followers the option of following him without being part of the church. The very act of regeneration by faith baptizes the believer into the body of Christ. Christ loves his bride and offers no fruitful path of faith outside the community of faith. And I always tell them when people say, I don't like church, but I like Jesus. I always answer, okay, so you like the husband but not the wife. How would the husband feel about that? I don't think the husband will get along with you very well. The boyfriend Jesus, this, this is a lie. The boy for Jesus. This Jesus hits close to home, for he is the Jesus of many, of many evangelical culture. The boyfriend Jesus hints at the truth of the Christ of Scripture, who is a friend of sinners, who offers personal salvation by faith. However, the boyfriend Jesus of some of our modern worship songs, I'm sorry, I'm a musician, I keep say, talking about worship, but the boyfriend Jesus of some of our modern worship songs sounds less like the righteous ruler of Revelation and more like Taylor Swift's ex-boyfriends. He is needy and clingy. This is more of a, a feminine Jesus. This is sometimes you come to churches and you don't hear a Jesus who is the king, who is the righteous judge, who is the most powerful being in the whole universe. No, you, 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 you come into these churches and you find a Jesus who, if you don't come to church, he cries. If you don't follow what he says, he feels sad and he's thrown and he's just looking like that. I'm sorry, my Jesus, if I don't do what he says, I am at last. What did Jesus say? If you are truly my friends, if you follow what I tell you. That's the Jesus of the Bible. That's the Jesus of the Bible. 
And finally, legalist Jesus. He's a Jesus who baptizes my traditions and preferences as orthodoxy. We do it better here at Point Cook. And every church across Australia should do it like we do it here. Or else they're wrong. I'm sure you don't say that. <laughs> and I hope you don't. But the church, the, biggest, the, the pastors of the biggest church in the United States, they were, they were um, interviewed by 2020. And it was shown in the um, Channel 9 Sunday nights. What's the report? What's the name of the show? Uh, a Current Affair. No, no, that, that, that's, the, that's the nightly one, but the one on Sundays. 60 Minutes, yes, on 60 Minutes. And the wife of the pastor of the biggest church in the United States says, they ask him, you don't have a pulpit. How come is that? And you see a lot of churches in Sydney, the biggest church in Sydney, they sing very good, they don't have a pulpit as well. And you do this and you do that. Why? Church is not like that. Church has not been known for, for not having a pulpit. And let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, if a church doesn't have a pulpit, I question the value they put on the Word of God. A lot of people just get up and talk about anything. But they don't preach Christ. So this wife of the pastor of the biggest church in the United States, she, she said, we want every church in America to look like ours, to preach like us, to be like us. That's legalistic Jesus. Where people believe that the way I do things is the best way. Let us pray that we don't go to that stream. So, who do you say Jesus is, Point Cook? Is it the Jesus who calls you to take up your cross and die every day and deny yourselves? Or is it the Jesus, one of these ten Jesus that I read? Or is it the Jesus that Peter wants? Or is it the Jesus that people want in the book of John, in the Gospel of John? It says that they were going to make him king. Why? Because he fed them. Prosperity. And what did Jesus do? Jesus quietly went away. So you wonder who, if Jesus is in those churches where they preach prosperity, Jesus quietly goes through the back door. You wonder if Jesus is truly there where they think that they have it all right. He quietly walks out the other door. You wonder if Jesus is there where they only sing songs about love. I love you, Jesus. I feel you every day. I want you to feel me. Oh, I raise my hands and blah, 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 blah. And they never sing, we proclaim you as the righteous judge, our savior, the one who's in charge of my life. Who is Jesus for you? And who is Jesus for me? Let us pray. Lord, have mercy on us that through the reading of your scripture, we may come to learn and love the real Jesus. This we pray. Amen.